Shyam Bhosle, Director of Hansa Embedded Systems Academy with us. He has already given a session over here, so I think uh, he does not need an introduction again. We have all attended one session of this. So, uh, yeah, I request you to start with the Yes. Okay, friends, let's uh, begin with the talk. I had mentioned that I'll be dealing with about three instruments. One of them was, sorry? I don't need a microphone. I'm loud enough. Are you going to record something? Yeah. Okay. The last lecture is on there on YouTube. You can see it on the Hello. 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 Hello, I think I'm audible. Okay, so we said that at the plan of lectures, uh, we will be dealing with the instrument called low pulse pulse oximeter, the andrometer, and the neurophobia. If the time permits, we'll be able to do all three, but otherwise, we'll concentrate more on pulse oximeter because that's a most critical instrument we are using in hospitals, particularly in the surgery room. When you are giving an anesthesia to a patient, you have to ensure that his oxygen level is monitored continuously. And it's a low cost. Uh, by low cost, we don't mean low quality. Low cost is in terms of mass production, and therefore the cost of the unit is brought down to as low as hundred dollars per unit. So let's see what exactly is this low cost pulse oximeter is. Okay. <coughs> What would be a useful device in hospitals of the developing world? A device to check oxygen saturation within a subset of patients. We are trying to measure the oxygen saturation level. This pulse oximeter not only measures the oxygen saturation, but also measures the pulse rate of a patient. It is different from the heart rate. Please remember this. Pulse rate are not the same as heart rate. They are normally same, but they may not be same at every time. Okay. <clears throat> what is the pulse oximeter? It detects the blood oxygen saturation. The prevention of complications by identification of hypoxia, hypoxemia. We'll understand what exactly this means. And used in cases where the symptoms and the feedback is limited under anesthesia because the patient is not able to tell the doctor what is happening to him because he's under anesthesia. He's unconscious in critical care or chronic conditions check up and infants, particularly infants, you're not able to tell the doctor what is wrong with the critical infant. So you have to have an oximeter. The neonatal babies which are born. Basically, premature babies, they are kept in a neonatal unit, which is equipped with a pulse oximeter. Okay. <clears throat> this is a typical, uh, you know, what are the pulse oximeters common in developing countries? You can see that there is a BCI, there is a company called BCI. It's a BCI fingerprint in the name, the Octave Tech 300 c and the, the Devon Medical C202. These are the models. You can see the price ranges. It's about... 600, is that right? 690 dollars? Yes. Yeah, 265 dollars and I'll go as 99 dollars. So it's just a clip which you can put it on the fingertip and you have two readings there. One is oxygen saturation level, uh, which happens to be uh, here 98, and then you also have the heart rate, which is about 70 per minute. That's exactly what we use it for. Okay, what is the oximetry principle? The light is passed or shined through the blood vessels. The absorption occurs in skin, the veins, and the arteries. Okay, these are the three places where the absorption of the light takes place. The arteries carry oxygenated blood, affects the absorption. So there are two curves you can see here. One is for the, uh, can I have a point to this? There's a point. So you see here that the curve, there are two curves, the red and the infrared are the two lights. One is 660 nanometers red, the wavelength, and 910 nanometers is the infrared. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. And you find that the absorption curve for the HVO2 is this particular one, and the HV, that is hemoglobin, is the blue light. Now we make use of this absorption properties of the uh, hemoglobin and oxygen hemoglobin. And from that we detect what exactly is the concentration of oxygen inside the patient's blood. 
Okay. Now this technique is non-invasive in the sense that you don't have to prick or you don't have to put inside the body anything. It is external. It looks at the fingertip here, or it looks at the ear lobe, or it looks at the forehead. So there are two types: one is the reflective type, and there is transmission type. A particularly in the ear lobe, when there is no bone mass, we use a transmission type. That's the most sensitive part of the body. Other is the fingertip, or, or you can take the toe of the, the infant. And the best method is, of course, not a very sensitive one, is the forehead. I'll tell you why the forehead is more better than the other places. Forehead is using a reflective type uh, mechanism. So there are two types of box the transmission type and the reflective type. Okay. <coughs> You'll have to study this physics if you can understand this absorption spectrum. Okay, two LEDs shine light of 600 nanometers, 660 and 940 nanometers, that is red and infrared, which is detected by a common photodiode on the opposite side. For example, if you take a light which is passing through this fingertip, from the top you'll have a red or infrared, red or infrared, not, not both together. And then you have a detector below, which is the photodiode detector. So remember now, these two are the effectors, as they mentioned, or actuators. And the down below you have a sensor, which is the photodiode sensor and it detects the output coming out. The ratio of absorption is used to calculate the oxygenation. So you, unless you understand what is absorption, you will not be able to find the ratio. I will be coming to the details about what is the absorption. Only changing signals are used. That means, what is the changing signal? Changing signal is your pulse rate. Everything else is constant. The bone mass, the other thing, everything is constant. Only that the changes is the pulse rate. And that is frequency of 0.8 hertz to 2 hertz. Now, when you say 2 hertz, how many cycles per minute? It's 120 beats per minute. 2 hertz per second multiplied by 60 is going to be 120 beats per minute as the pulse rate. And at 0.8 hertz, you can find out how much it is yourself. If it's 1 hertz, it's going to be 60. 0.8 is going to be less than that. Okay. If any questions you have, you can always ask me. What are the probe types? The transmitter type. That is, you pass the light through this finger and detect on the other side. Or the ear lobes on either side. One side you have a sensor, other side you have the transmitter. I mean, you also have the LEDs, the red and infrared. And so that's a transmission type. Or reflectant types requires an underlying bone, which is a forehead, needs more light for uh, better detectors, offers different design possibilities. For example, when the light passes through this, it only passes once. But if reflected light, it has to go through this and come back again. So it has to traverse more path, twice the path, and therefore require more intensity of the uh, source and also a better detector. So uh, the, the disadvantage of the uh, reflector type is it requires a uh, more powerful source and the wide area detector which is capable of detecting the light which has traveled it twice, so attenuation becomes twice. But what happens at what is when you put something on the forehead, there is no movement on the forehead normally. Whereas if it's on the ear lobe and the fingertip, you have the motion of the hand which can cause or reduce and with errors. Okay, what's the next? Considerations and limitations. Precision should be within 5%. Last time I told you what is the precision. You must understand precision in context of what I explained last time. Precision is within 5%, preferably 3%. Cost should be low. Final product manufacturable at $8. When you're manufacturing something at $8, you sell it at $99, you're almost making 10 times the money. And considering all the, you know, we like the, uh, commission for the agents or not, you still make good enough of money for that. Should be durable and easy to repair. It should be convenient to use and compatible with the driver circuits. I'll come to driver circuits. There are two types of drivers. One is called voltage driver and it's called current driver. So we will prefer to use a current driver in this property. And you know there's Holland Current Pump. You can go to the article on Google, find out what is the Holland Current Pump. It has got a sourcing and sinking capability. Okay, <clears throat> how does it look like? Okay, this is your two LEDs, which you can see red and infrared. Infrared is not visible. And the photo transistor, it is here, the photo transistor is at the bottom and the infrared LED is at the top, which is written exactly opposite. Okay, you put it like this, so the two, they are these two sources are at the top, and the bottom there is a common detector, which is a silicon photo diode. Okay, pros and cons, convenient for short checks, unreliable. Peripheral circulation, fingernail polish, this is exactly what I advise the girls not to use fingernail polish because more you get hospitalized. That's what exactly they do. They cut your nails because if you have long nails, you cannot put a finger tip sensor on your finger. And another thing is that it has to be no nail polish. You take it off. 
and it wears off easily. I used to wear off every time with a finger and there's a scratch which is produced on the surface of the detector. So they will have to, it's a wear, I mean the wear and tear is higher in this case. Okay, what happens in the four, I'm sorry. These guys keep on advertising and we don't buy it so they keep on disturbing us every now and then. What happened? Yes. yes. Okay, fine. Now you see here, there are two LEDs in the middle, red and infrared, and there are three detectors. Okay, and that's what you put on the forehead with a bandage. And there's no movement. Once you put it, there's no movement subsequently. Particularly a child or even an adult, normally you don't shake your head every now and then. Probably you will shake your hand and the air low, but not be. So, what's the advantage? It's durable. Reliable circulation, versatile adjustment, works on all age groups, right from a child to an adult or the old man. Constant, they continue to adjust headband, low signal resolution, and possibility of misuse. This is exactly the problem which we find with the four transmitter type. Okay, apart from the fact that there's low sensibility. Now, ear lobe sensor is the best. In ear lobe, you wear it like a earring, it looks like a earring. You have got a phototransistor uh, onto the detector and two LEDs on the left hand side. And the advantage of earring is, I mean, not earring, the ear lobe is that there is no bone mass, so there is no attenuation. You get a maximum signal coming out of the detector. Convenient for spot checks, reliable circulation, high signal resolution. Remember, resolution and precision are different things, like I mentioned to you last time. And then, moving parts, possibly not as durable, adjustability is lower. You cannot, you know, if you just something happens to your lobe and then you you just study your life again, the signal disturbs. So we don't recommend this in terms of the uh, resolution and the adjustments. Okay. Now, the other option, the matrix is, if you look at the cost, accuracy, the ease of use, the range of use, and the real thing, you can see those figures can tell you. And which is the best is the EA Pro. Okay. Now, uh, we are trying to design a 24 by 7 variable pulse oximeters where ear lobe would be the best place to use it. You can't do it on the forehead, people will laugh at you. And neither we can use on the fingertip because you can't use the finger for anything else. Yeah. Okay, so ear lobe is the best option. It does. It looks like a earring, so people don't know that you are using a pulse oximeter. Okay, future work. I mean, this is a group which was working. A finalized housing design, proper mounting of electronics, determination of exact material, current specifications, addition of filters, mechanical testing of devices. Okay, fine. Okay. This is some very small presentation. This was a semester project. You have to test the probe's accuracy, and you repeat again accuracy, the ease of use, mechanically test the probe's durability, and develop mm -hmm. working prototype. Fine. The conclusion is a pulse oximeter probe can be, must be designed that is not only durable, but also it accurate, cheap, and can be used for a variety of patients. Transmitters to the ear, robust mechanical design that will be easy for the doctors to use and adjust extremely durable. Okay, fine. Now let's understand what exactly is the background paper these people must have looked at before they started designing the figurative sensor. So we study a paper which is the golden standard in the world called HP. HP has an eight wavelength uh, colorimetry. And if you use a red and infrared, you're talking about the oxygen region. If you use a red and green, you're talking about the bilirubin test. Okay, so let's look at the, how the signal gets modulated when it comes to the oxygen level. Fine. So I'll now take the actual paper which we studied before we developed this project for LNT. I did work for LNT and developed a product for them. Fine. So let's now see if we have that word document with me. It's a PDF document. It's a new family of sensors for pulp. HP has got a division which is looking after the biomedical instruments with the manufacturer for various monitoring and many other applications. Now, let's go to the actual. This paper, I'll be giving it to you, so you don't have to copy anything from here. But just see some of the uh, pictures here. Here they have shown, if you look at it clearly, this is your probe with the red infrared light on the top. This is a clip. This is a photodiode here, a wide area photodiode. And this is a finger. You can see this? This is a finger with a nail. So obviously, if there's a nail or a polish on it, this instrument will not work properly. That's why nail polishers will be removed before you put up a pulse meat. Now what happens is, the red light passes through the blood, the infrared also passes through the blood, and then detected on the photodiode. But in the body, it's only one light at a time. It is not both red and infrared. It has to be either red, it has to be either uh, the infrared or none. For none, we mean ambient. 
Fine. <laughs> okay, any questions here? You can ask them. Otherwise, we'll move to the next. Okay. Now, the famous law of absorption says that the output light is the the light incident, which is I0, into exponential e raised to minus extension coefficient C and D. D is the path length or the length of the path. This, this distance is called D. So these terms are self-explanatory, you can refer to this paper. Now from this, we come to a formula for red and infrared, and we come out with a term which is called the ratio. This is explained here. You can see that whenever the heart pumps blood, there's a swelling of this tube, which is the artery. This is the venous block. Artery always goes from heart to the fingertip, and the, the uh, veins will take the blood back from the, the fingertip to heart. This is red in color, this is blue in color. Venous blood is always bluish, and the, uh, artery, the, the arterial blood is red. So whenever the heart pumps blood into this, there's a swelling of the artery. That means there is a change in the diameter of the artery, and therefore that produces an AC signal. Artery has some dimension, let's say one millimeter, and it changes from one millimeter to 1.1 millimeter whenever the heart pumps the blood into the artery, I'm mean, sorry, the heart pumps blood into the fingertip artery. Obviously what you would have, there's a path length changes from D to D plus delta D. That's why it is called pulse oximetry. The pulse means, it's not a DC value, it's the AC value. The change in the arterial dimensions causes a signal, which is an AC signal. Is this, is this clear? Are you with me? What I'm trying to explain. Okay, now what happens is the incident light I0, I AD, and you've got a light coming out, you have to detect I min and I max of the light. So obviously, total data that doesn't produce a voltage, it produces the current. You have to have current to voltage converter, which will convert into voltage domestic. Okay. <coughs> Next we have is a term called ratio R. This R all these mathematics you have to work out yourself. You can see it's the log of I max by I min for the lambda 1 and divided by log of I max by I min for the lambda 2. Lambda 1 and lambda 2 are red and infrared. These are the two wavelengths, 550 and 916 nanometers. Now when you make an instrument, you are supposed to do all the mathematical computation and get this value of R. It's not straightforward. There are a lot of approximations you have to do. You have to calculate a log. You have to call it is log of A by B. What is log of A by B? It is log A minus log B. Mm. Okay? And there are certain approximations that you do when you do this type of calculations. Similarly here, it is log of I max lambda 2 minus log of I min minus and then find the ratio R. Ratio R varies from 0 to 1. And for this value of 0 to 1, you have a SPO2, which is oxygen saturation level, which is given by an equation, which will be explained next. Okay, you are making use of absorption spectra. Excuse me. I am busy. I am busy right now in the lecture. Can we, you can call me after two hours. Can you just switch it off? Okay. Now, this is a typical behavior. You can have the ratio R, which is taking a value from 0 to 3, right? And the oxygen saturation of SpO2. Now, this is a standard Lambert BS law. This is what the HP instrument is. And you can find here that this type of behavior and this type of behavior is a deviation of the instrument because the, the formula, there's no formula. The formula has been derived using the empirical results. That means the experiment was carried on a number of patients in the lab in a non-invasive manner by taking the blood out and taking the oxygen saturation level. And therefore, the, there is some deviation. The instrument behaves with this top curve, and the actual law is like this. So when you approximate this law, you get something uh, which is a linear equation of a straight line. What would be the equation of a straight line like this? If you take a straight line here, SpO2 is equal to the intercept. As you can tell, so the straight line joining from this point to this point here, what would you call this straight line equation? It's the y to the c minus mx, where c is 113 as the intercept of the y-axis and the slope is 27. So you can write down sp is equal to 
113 minus 27 into R and substitute the value of R as 0 0.5 which means 27 half is 13 130 minus 13 is 100 percent. So normally when the ratio is 1 the SPO2 will be equal to 100 or maybe typically 99 or 98. When the ratio becomes equal to 0 that is here you got the value as 113 because that slope gets multiplied by the 0 and when the ratio becomes equal to 1 here you get a value of between around 85 the lower value and that's where the patient is almost dead and if you get oxygen to the level which is close to 85 it's a very critical condition and you have to put him on the ventilator and give him enough oxygen so that you can make him survive okay if you follow this if you have a paper i can probably can i use this board here behind okay let me complete this and then i'll go to the board later on now this is a typical LED here. What is infrared? They are anti-parallel. You can remember the red and infrared is an anti-parallel. So when the current flows out of this circuit, it is called I source. So the red is going to become on. When it sinks the current, the infrared is going to be on. So there are three states. So you have a red on, infrared on, and you got here this one where both the red and infrared are off. At that time, the photodiode sees the ambient light. Ambient light is the light around here in this room. Because you're putting a clip, the light can see both the side, okay, and that's the ambient light. And that's not going to be constant. It's going to change with the different ambient condition. For example, now the ambient light is because of the skylight here. When the, it's become dark, the ambient light is going to be because of the lights that you put in the room. So ambient light causes one error called the DC shift caused by the ambient light. So that's source of error you have to take care of. So it has to be compensating it for the ambient light correction. You have to do automatically in the instrument. Are you with me? So you are trying to get a red light, infrared light, and the ambient light. When the both the LEDs are off, it becomes ambient light. Remember, it is either red or infrared. It's not both. So you get this type of output here. You get ambient light, red light, and infrared light. Typically, the photodiode will give you more output for the infrared light. Therefore, the height of the infrared is more, less for the red light, and Blue output for the background, we call it as the ambient. This goes on. Now, what happens is this is your LED, either this or this. You have got a current to voltage converter. You can see this, it's a current to voltage converter. You're putting the resistance in the feedback path of the op amp. So it takes a current flowing through for the detector. This is not a LED, mind you. This is not a LED, it is a detector. It's a photo detector. When the light falls onto it, Depending on the energy of the photons, which like that, you'll get a photo current. Okay? Irrespective of what is the direction of this. It, it doesn't know whether it's coming from the red light or infrared light or ambient. Any condition of light which falls onto this detector produces a voltage which is positive. Why positive? The direction of current is the tire will be connected from anode to cathode, so that the current has to flow from this. So this has to be at a higher potential with this put to the ground. Now you've got three sample and mode circuits. What does one? This will become on. When you should this become on? Here, in the center of this. The red will become on, so that will direct the red output. The infrared will be the second op amp, and the ambient has to be subtracted from both the signals, therefore, whenever the ambient light is, uh, the detects the ambient light, you sample that and hold, hold it here, and you subtract it from both these two. So you get directly only red contribution or only infrared contribution. Are you with me? What I'm going to say? You are using an op amp to subtract the common mode signal. In op amps, typically you talk about common mode signal. This is a common mode signal, is the ambient light, which is there in both red and infrared. So you have to subtract that, and that's the best way to do is to this. What is the advantage of this method over the you could have also taken all these three separately. You don't have to do subtraction here. You could have done subtraction after logging all the values of red, infrared, and ambient. And you could have subtracted every time digitally the angle reading from the red reading, angle reading from the infrared reading. But that would cost the macular system to do a more job than with all bodies of the Now, here what do you require? You require only two channel ADC one for red and one for infrared. Is that working? Otherwise, you would require three channel ADC and make a three arrays and use one array of the ambient to subtract the value of the ambient from the red and infrared. Then you would save hardware. You will not require the subtract the circuit. You could have you could have all these two op amps and they directly connect channel 0, channel 1, channel 2, channel 2 is looking at the ambient. 
and take the channel to really subtract from channel one and channel zero, uh, zero channel one, you have to be two back. That's one way of doing it. This is another approach of doing that. If you're comfortable with whatever I said, we'll do the next. Any questions? Yes, any questions from anybody? There's any students here who are students there, or any other staff members who would like to get that so clarified. If you're going to do implement a macro granular design, remember, the lesser your time spent on doing the peripheral work, like uh, you know, subtraction of the two columns and all, is your better off because you can do that time for computation of the SPO2, which is quite difficult. But there you will do a ratio of the logarithms. So log of A by B divided by log of C by D, you have to do it in almost two milliseconds. And then compute SPO2. Okay, that's the purpose what we are explaining the logarithm. Okay, now what type of signals you get? What type of analog signals you would expect? You get this type of signals. One is for the infrared. This is the typical output you can get. And this is the output for the red. Now you can see here there is an I max and I minimum. The photodetector output currents for the infrared. And similarly you have an I max and I minimum for the red. So you are, what you do is you have to have an ADC which will sample every point on this curve. Also every point on this curve. And then you have to find out the ma ma maximum minimum of the array. That, that is the typical program which you write on a microcontroller or a microprocessor. If your array is given to you, you find the maximum point and the minimum point. Here you find that each each of this curve has a local maximum and a local minimum. This is a local maximum, local minimum of the infrared. This is a local maximum, local minimum of the infrared. This is a very theoretical curve where you have no DC shape. So there is also called global maximum and global minimum. So first from the array you detect what is the local maximum and local minimum and then you find out what is the global maximum and global minimum. Are you understanding what I am saying? In an array, you may have a local maximum or a local minimum and also in such a reading, you have a global reading. Fine, so separately the infrared patient signals with their I mean and X values caused by the arterial pulsation. Okay. <laughs> if there are no questions, we can proceed further. Now let's talk about errors. If you are able to detect I max and I min properly for red and infrared, like when you can also detect I max and infrared, you have to remember the formula for ratio R, which is log of I max by I min for red and log of I min for infrared. So substitute those four values, you can calculate R. If you can calculate R, you can go back and find so the linear equation SPO is equal to 130 minus 27 into R and you can get the value of SPO2. This is a simple computation. But remember, this has to be done using floating point arithmetic. You cannot use the integer arithmetic here. That means you have to write a code in assembly in floating point arithmetic and use that. Because if you use a C code here, the C code compilation as well as the execution of C code is not always an efficient method of programming. So this computation we always do it in assembly programming and that too using floating point. And floating point support is not available for microcontroller. It's only there for ADH5. But you don't want to use any file. You want to use microcontroller. So you have to make a mixed combination of, you know, how do you calculate a log? You have to make a lookup table of the log. Once you get I max and I min, you look up, go to the lookup table and find out the log value. Then again find out log, uh, for the denominator and for the similarly for the numerator. And then take the ratio of these two. And mind you, well, it's not going to be a, it's going to be a fraction because it's going to be 1 or 0.5. It's fairly complex math you have and this has to be done for each and every beat, remember. For every heartbeat, you are supposed to do this. So you have to be extremely good in writing your software. Awesome. And that's why we talk about real-time operating systems. Because in real time, even if you get a correct answer, if it is not in that time frame, the answer is meaningless. For example, if you prepare for a first year exam, science exam, or first year engineering exam, or the first semester, and if your results are there in the fourth semester, it makes no sense. Before the second semester is done, you must have your result in your hand. Likewise, here, yeah, after the first heart beats, before the second one beats, you must have the competition ready. And it will be displayed also, remember. You have to be displayed, you have to average it, do everything. Because this has to be also used for arrhythmia detection. All of you know what is arrhythmia. So consequently, heart beats must have the same value. If they are not, then you are supposed to defibrillate your heart and ensure that the rhythm is maintained. So this is a very critical unit. And therefore, the cost can vary as low as $99 to as high as ten thousand US dollars. And that's where we talk about what are the errors and how the elimination of errors is taking place in the, the biomedical instrument called the pulse oximeter. 
if you are through, if you are comfortable with whatever you are discussed right now, we will talk about the five sources of errors which uh, can disturb the reading of the first source. Okay. The first source is the ambient light. So ambient light correction has to be done every time. You have to ensure that the ambient light doesn't change drastically. Second one is the DC shift caused by the movement of the hand. For example, you put it on the finger there and the patient just moves his hand, that will cause a DC shift in the signal. It could be plus or minus. And therefore, this level will shift either upwards or this level will go down. So you have to compensate for that DC shift. It's going to be low frequency signal. So one is ambient, which is a DC. The error caused by the movement of the hand is the low frequency AC in the range of one or two hertz. So you have to filter that. Uh, sorry, not one or two hertz. It's 0.1 hertz. You don't move your hand at one hertz frequency. It's not possible. So normally, this minor shift of the hand will cause a DC shift. That you have to be corrected for. So you now we put a, a bypass filter so that the lower values of the errors are removed. What is the high frequency noise which will come here? If the patient gets a fever, then he, there is a shiver in his hand. That shiver causes high frequency noise of the order of about 4 to 5 kilohertz. So that also has to be eliminated. So if you have a bandwidth of 0.8 hertz to 2 hertz, you can eliminate the lower DC shift and the high frequency shift, which is called by the shiver noise. Then the fourth one is called the uh, conductive noise. That means the wires which are giving a power supply to the uh, your unit also can conduct the electrical noise from the mains and it can also affect the instrument. And the last one is the radiated noise. If you have a, a, a cautery machine in the hospital which is doing the cutting of a patient's body, that can cause uh, the radiation, that is a, typically that radiation which is in the high frequency bandwidth, that radiation can be absorbed by the instrument and then you get erroneous results. So if your instrument is able to detect all these five errors, yes, the instrument price will go up. It's going to remain the same thing. It's, it's going to always show the SPO2 and the oxygen saturation level. So you have the pulse rate. But then, if your elimination of error takes place, you're happy about it. And you pay more if you want to have it. So gold tank from HP could be anything about 10 to 15 lakh rupees per instrument. Whereas the nurse carries the pulse which is just $100 for. Is that fine? Is there any questions here? We can uh, otherwise, we have taken a very ideal case of these signals. These signals are not as rosy as this. This is a diacrotic notch built in, you can see that this is a diacrotic notch. So this basically detects the blood pressure also, indirectly. You will not tell you exactly what the blood pressure is, but the amplitude is proportion to the blood pressure. Now, there is also called a perfusion level. Perfusion is how much of the blood is flowing into the fingertips. So if you close your, if you close the artery like this, okay, you will find that the pulse rate will go to zero. And if you keep it pressed for more than two hours, this will develop a gangrene. So to ensure that, you know, this is always loose. If you put a blood pressure cuff here, you can lose your hand because if there's nobody attention to that blood pressure cuff, there will be no flow of blood inside the subsequent one and then it is a death. And there's no other option but to cut the hand. So it, you will be extremely careful in ICU that you cannot put a blood pressure on all the time. And therefore electronic blood pressures are not recommended. You use a manual blood pressure. Because somebody is there to that. What exactly is the advantage of this time. instrument? It can detect, it can give an early warning of a possible cardiac failure. Yeah. Because if heart is not in a position to pump blood into the peripheral organs, there is what is known as the impotency cost in the males because the peripheral organs are also in our region. And if there is no blood flow there, you have an impotency called the, uh, either the organic or psychogenic. Normally it is the organic impotency which is detected by this uh, signal. So there should be sufficient quantity of blood which has to flow into the peripheral organs. If it doesn't flow, your heart is weak. And that can cause a, it's basically an early warning signal for ED or possibly a heart attack. A malfunctioning heart can be deteriorated for this pulse I mean, you require a fairly sophisticated algorithms to go beyond just the indication of pulse rate and the oxygen that like. Okay, now how will you find the period of this waveform? How will you find the pulse rate from the given this data, which is the digitalized data of this waveform? How will you find the pulse rate? This is anybody's guess. I can have a dedicated instrument. I can convert this into a square wave, and I use that square wave to find the heart rate. Or from the data itself, I can detect the heart rate. Just anybody's guess. Yeah. 
If you look at the time difference between this and this, what is the time slot which has left from this peak to this peak? You're basically getting a yeah. peaks we have to consider. Yeah, so you can do not have to make a separate instrument for a heart rate monitor. You can look at the array and find out where the reading repeats. And find out the time slot between the first reading and the, the next one. So local maxima one and local maxima two, if you take the time difference when it occurred, it gives you the period. You can invert the period and that will give you the heart rate. Is that logic clear? But it requires that you keep on looking at your data all the time. So this is not preferred method. Although this will make the instrument much cheaper, but your software algorithm and overheads are going to be pretty high. Not only that you have to data, uh, take that array, you have to use the DNA method, direct memory access method, because you don't have time to you know, take a CPU, look at the data of the ADC and put it in the memory. No, it has to be direct DMA. So we use a chip called ISAC, uh, which supports the DMA mode. ISAC stands for the Intelligent Sensor Actuator Converter made by the analog devices. And you can use that IC, which is a, a high pin derivative of <coughs> 8051 microcode. So anything that repeats can give you the rate of this waveform, which is, happens to be from the heart or from the pulse. So it's called a pulse rate meter or a Heart rate. As I said, in a typical condition, when I press this finger, your pulse rate goes to zero, but heart is still pumping. This also works as a lie detector. I told you, because if there's a hardened criminal, he can look at the crime scene, but can need not change his heart rate, but the pulse rate changes. From that, we find out whether he's telling the truth or not. This is used in defense of psychological research also, DRPR and Delhi, for detection of the, the interrogation of the enemy when he's captured on the border. So there are any number of applications you can have for the pulse rate. Okay, now this is as far as the uh, how to calculate SQ. Now I'm asking a question: If you don't have a method of finding out the time difference between this and this, can you measure the pulse rate by any other method? So how do you measure the frequency? Can I want to know? I want to make this as an interactive. How do you measure the frequency of a waveform? What do you define by frequency? Is the number of events taking place per unit time is the frequency? You have a frequency of train which is every three minutes on the western railway. So that's the frequency. Three times per minute. So how many times heart beats in a minute? Typically, iceberg, who wants to play his finals? What would be anything? Any problem? Okay, so I can find register. Maybe my PC has uh, okay, so, sorry. Okay, fine. Yes. Now, if I have got this time base. As one minute, then how many such waveforms that I'm going to get is going to give me a heart rate or the pulse rate. Is that correct? If my heart beats at 60 beats per minute, what is the frequency of the signal? If my heart beats at 60 beats per minute, what is the frequency of the signal? In hertz. It's one hertz. Is that clear? One hertz frequency will give me 60 beats per minute. If it's 2 hertz, then it's going to give me 120 beats per minute. If it's 1.5 hertz, it's going to give me 90 beats per minute. So I'm talking about a frequency measurement of signals which have a frequency from 0.8 hertz to 2 hertz. It's going to be extremely low frequency measurement. And if I want to get a reading of 60 on my meter, how long I have to wait to get a count of 60? Assuming the heart beats at 60 beats per minute, how long I must wait and count the waveform till I get a heart rate of 60. Why? What's the difficulty? This is a simple question. Heart is beating at 60 beats per minute. To get a count of 60 on my display, how much time I must spend? Sorry? One minute. That's it's a very simple answer. That's what exactly the Ayurvedic doctors do. They hold your hand, what you call it Nadi Parisha, and they wait for one minute and count the number of beats that they feel. That's going to be. So time required for getting a reading of 60 is one minute. In one minute, a patient can die if it's like pain. So we must have a counting method, which is one period of the day. But within this time slot, from here to here, I must be able to immediately tell her what is the pulse rate. I can't wait for one minute. So within one second, I must be able to say, yeah, that now this is the pulse rate. Now to do that, there are methods available, which is known as to multiply the frequency by using a PLL or use a reciprocal counting or period invariant method. In period invariant method, what we do, we find the time last with this maximum and this maximum. This period, if you know, then reciprocate that, F is equal to 1 over T. 
you know that the relation, relation between the frequency and the period. So if we measure the period, we can reciprocate that value and get the frequency. Is that clear? So that is the method we have to adopt for the heart rate meters, particularly when you are talking about the reading every one second. If the heart beats at 120 beats per minute, then you have to have a reading every half a second. Every 0.5 seconds, you must be able to display. If the reading uh, heart beats at 150, you can imagine. The, the time available for you is this period only for calculating your heartbeat. And that's why your software has to be extremely fast, which is not possible in a microcontroller. So we do a separate dedicated instrument called a heart rate monitor. And that is uh, also combined as a part of your pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter gives you oxygen saturation level by this conventional ADC method and all. And also gives you a heart rate with a separate detector circuit that you convert this into a square wave and measure the period of the waveform by period inversion method. You have to use a timer counter circuit inside the microcontroller for 8051. One of the timer has to be used as a counter, one of the period counter has to be used as a timer. And you measure the period with a one microprecision clock. So accuracy of measurement is one microsecond. And you're measuring about 0.5 seconds in that. And then you have to do a division to give you the so everything requires floating point arithmetic here. Without floating point arithmetic, you cannot do it. So you have to not only be strong in the your bit manipulation method, but you must have a combination of microprocessor and a microprocessor. And that's where the uh, Isaac chip will help you. You have a lot of memory inside to put the application software that you want to do. Fine, so I think that finishes at least the basics of what the pulse oximeter is. I'm not going to go into the details. That is, in a, you have any number of papers on pulse oximeters. HP's paper is just one of the papers. I have about 29 GB of software, which I'm going to give it to you. Probably you will spend another say, the next six months only reading out personal instruments. Okay, so I cannot complete that in one hour. I'm just going to give you the clues where this instrument information can be read. Okay, <clears throat> any questions? So regarding Holland current pumps, you are aware of what is the Holland current pump? You have got the current pump in the first place. There are two types of voltage sources available in the world. One is voltage source, other is a current source. If it's a bidirectional voltage source, like a positive and negative, we call it as a bipolar voltage source. If it's a current source or current sink, they together form a current pump. Current pump means current which can be thrown out of the instrument and can be sinked into the instrument. So it's called a current. And Holland is the person, it's a configuration which is used for designing an extremely constant current as a function of time and the load. So you can go to Google and find out what is the Holland current pump. Otherwise, you can send an email to me. I can give you some more information on Holland current pumps. But that's what is required here. If you go to the website, my website, or if you go to YouTube, I will explain in the lectures on WRSA, I given 11 February 2010, the entire design of Holland current pumps. So you can refer to those presentations on the pulse oximeter. OK, so what's the time available? It's three, I've got half an hour more. So maybe I can discuss another instrument, which again requires a Holland current pump. Okay, my option is to give you an Holland current pump design, so we can probably you know, write something on the board if you have provision to write on the board. Yes. And I'll show you how an uh, importance monitoring instrument called the NPD model is made. Hmm. 